I'm Julie Cazzetti. I'm the Global Research Director for the International Centre for Journalists, ICFJ. And you're joining us for another in our series of webinars uh, during the, the COVID-19 crisis, uh, part of our forum, uh, Global Health Forum uh, on crisis reporting connected to COVID-19. Um, and today we're going to be talking about covering the infodemic, navigating the infodemic, um, or uh, perhaps we should term this covering the, the disinfodemic. Um, I'm going to share with you some research that we're just publishing as we go to air, so to speak, um, about that very theme. But just to give us uh, some background for, for this discussion, I'll introduce our guests in a moment. Um, it's, it's important to note that as we continue uh, to grapple with COVID-19 as a pandemic, we're faced with a, a parallel crisis, and that's a crisis that the World Health Organization has uh, called an infodemic. Many of you would have heard that by now. Um, and that's the idea of an ever increasing flood of misinformation, disinformation, and just a pile on of information. Um, as, and the public struggle to try and separate uh, fact from fiction, truth from rumors, um, and that total uh, amount of information as the uh, pandemic itself spreads. So as I said, today, uh, ICFJ has actually published two new research reports in partnership with the United Nations, in fact, with UNESCO. Um, and these reports describe the flood of potentially deadly disinformation connected to COVID-19. We're calling this a disinfodemic because of what we've mapped. So we've identified nine main themes of disinformation connected to uh, the pandemic along with four different types of uh, distribution methods and 10 ways that we're seeing uh, organizations, companies, governments, intergovernmental organizations uh, around the world responding to this crisis, often with significant implications for media freedom among other uh, human rights. So we'll be reporting uh, on IJNet and on ICFJ and through our social channels uh, as will UNESCO as well about this research um, as the day goes on and, and the week goes on. Uh, but we're going to be using the disinfodemic hashtag on social media also to um, have a discussion about that research. But first, uh, I need to uh, introduce you to our guests um, and they're going to be discussing these very issues, um, how to cover the infodemic and, and the disinfodemic or what uh, we can do to uh, prepare ourselves and perhaps partly inoculate ourselves against um, this flood of, uh, of disinformation. So joining us is Andy Carvin. He's a senior fellow at the Digital Forensic Research Lab, DFR Lab as it's known. And he's joined by uh, Indian health journalist Nayantara Narayanan. Uh, she's with Proto, which is uh, an, a, a partner project of ICFJ. And as I said, we're going to be taking a look at global trends in COVID-19 disinformation. I mean, some of the things uh, we've together been observing are um, scams and crackdowns connected to disinformation, uh, issues around health equipment, um, attacks on journalists who are critical of, of those in, uh, in power, and assaults on democracy itself that um, are designed to seed panic um, and certainly have an impact on global markets. So that's what we've been observing. Um, we want you, uh, those of you participating in this webinar, to participate um, by asking questions either uh, within the Facebook uh, forum that ICFJ has running or um, through the, the webinar interface if you've registered for this webinar. Um, and if you're watching this uh, in delay, as many people do, then uh, I suggest you, you ask to join if, if you're a journalist, uh, ICFJ and IJ's, IJ Net's uh, Global Health Crisis Reporting Forum, and we'll uh, follow up on some of the issues there. So Andy, let's get this conversation rolling. Sure. You're, you're a journalist, uh, uh, originally uh, having worked with NPR and others, but you're known to many of us as a, as a pioneer, really, of, of social journalism or social reporting, um, courtesy of that uh, pretty extraordinary work you did around um, the Arab Spring. Um, and you kind of introduced us to the concept, really, of um, open verification, for, for example. So the sorts of methods that we um, deployed in the context of what we might refer fondly <laughs> now to, um, you know, a web that felt less weaponized than it does today, where disinformation was perhaps not the word that rolled off our tongue when we, we started talking about social media. So I'm particularly interested, given that background, to hear from you about 
what you're absorbing, observing in your role as, as a, a senior research fellow with the Atlantic Council's lab, looking at disinformation, particularly on the social web, um, in the context of this pandemic. Can you just reflect on that, perhaps that trajectory from um, the front line of, of you know, surfacing reporting um, sure. and, and to now? Well, uh, I, I think the perspective I can give is, is actually coming from uh, uh, more of the point of view of an editor now because uh, I'm, I've been serving as interim editor at DFR Lab uh, for a while now and, and I coordinate all of our COVID-19 coverage and so I'm not doing much original reporting myself anymore but we have a team of nearly 20 reporters on five different continents monitoring uh, information environments in their local languages and their local cultures. Normally we do this year round in, in times when there isn't uh, uh, a pandemic going on, but we've turned all of our attention to COVID-19 and we're almost exclusively reporting on it at this point. And, um, yeah, I mean, a lot has has certainly changed over the last 10 years on social media to the point where everything's somewhat spun out of control. Uh, and uh, so what we try to do at the DFR Lab is try to get a better sense of, of where misinformation and disinformation is coming from, who's behind it, and what their motivations are. And in the case of COVID-19, there have really been five... Uh, threads that we see emerging again and again. Mm -hmm. um, the first being is convergences of authoritarian narratives. Mm -hmm. um, historically, for example, you would see disinformation that came out of uh, Russia versus China very differently. Uh, Russia always seemed to be uh, the joker of the internet in the sense of, of wanting to set the world on fire and create chaos and divisiveness, whereas China was very much more focused on maintaining their public brand, uh, uh, projecting their soft power. Uh, and so they both used disinformation in various ways, but they had a different way of looking at it. But recently, that's, that's converged. We're seeing much more coming out of China that's, uh, that's more antagonistic, talking about bioweapons coming out of the U.S. Army. Well, at the same time, while Russia continues to do its traditional types of disinformation, they're also, um, they're also talking about their humanitarian efforts. So they're talking about their soft power. We're also seeing uh, economic disinformation. Uh, sometimes it's, uh, it's very targeted to consumers where people are trying to sell quack cures and the like. Uh, other times it's as sophisticated as trying to destabilize economies, mm -hmm. such as when Russian sources were reporting that Boris Johnson was on a ventilator and thus suggesting he was on the verge of death. Uh, that could very easily, easily destabilize uh, British markets if, if it had been picked up beyond uh, the fringes. Uh, then you have general exploitation efforts. So this is religious exploitation, political exploitation, people trying to rally their bases. Uh, it sometimes comes in the form of COVID deniers, such as President mm. Bolsonaro in Brazil or Lukashenko in Belarus. Um, and then the last one uh, you could describe as old narrative, but new COVID twist. So mm -hmm. the bioweapons bio is a good example because yeah. there, there's been disinfo about bioweapons and chemical weapons since the beginning of the Cold War. Um, and one recent narrative we uh, uncovered, uh, there was a rumor spreading in Italy saying that helicopters were going to spread uh, chemicals on the populace to fight. COVID-19. And within two weeks, the narrative had morphed to 30 countries, at least 30 countries, into many different languages, all taking on different themes and styles based on what might have resonated the most in those particular countries. So okay. in a sense, it mutated like a virus would and became different informational strains. But what's interesting is that the rumor is based somewhat on actual world events, because in the US, for example, when it's mosquito season, it's not unusual to see municipalities okay. spraying uh, uh, against mosquitoes. When the Zika outbreak happened, both in Brazil and when, it's, and, and when it became a concern in Miami, uh, there was spraying taking place from a variety of vehicles. Uh, drones have been used in China to uh, spray uh, chemicals in, in certain uh, tests against COVID-19. And so while it seems like one of those black helicopter conspiracies that you would hear against the UN or whatever, be 
because it's 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 a it sounds like a combination of traditional conspiracy theories with some actual historical events it takes on a life of its own and and it becomes usable by people across the political spectrum based on their interests and we can certainly see that uh, unfolding to an extent in the u.s um in terms of some of the the, the, the narratives that are being taken forward in, in protests oh very probably. much so like e yeah. everything uh, everything regarding uh uh chloroquine and hydroxychloroquine and the many narratives that have come out of that uh we've seen similar narrative narratives related to interferon being um a miracle cure that's popped up in latin america and even in, in south us uh, uh, south africa too and so uh, there definitely seem to be themes that reemerge again and again, and and not always disinfo. I, there's a decent amount of what we're seeing is is, is good old fashioned misinformation. People yeah. panicking, people sharing rumors they've heard, uh, yeah. things that are completely unattributable, but take on a life of its own. Which which is why I really like the, the World Health Organization's use of the term infodemic because whether it's real information or false information it's increasing at an exponential rate, not unlike the pandemic itself. Indeed. Um, and we'll come back to some of those, those issues and terms um, in a little while. Now, Tara, I want to come to you now. You've um, been, you're a very experienced reporter on issues of uh, health and medicine, um, and you're now involved in uh, various, um, doing your own reporting, but involved in various uh, projects designed to sort of assist um, journalism more broadly, I suppose, to, to um, apply some of these techniques to covering a pandemic. Can you just talk to us first of all about what you're seeing uh, and hearing about on the ground uh, in India, particularly um, for those people who are watching India from a distance and um, seeing that you know, many of the, the memes around uh, treatments and cures, for example, um, seem to have some kind of you know, connection to uh, India, whether it's um, a, a applying a, a myth like uh, drinking cow urine or you know, whatever else it, it may be. There's, there's identification of, uh, of both the source and uh, the themes of some of that disinformation being prevalent in India. So what, what, what have you observed? Yes, you know, first of all, being on the ground here uh, in, in, in time of social distancing and lockdown is very much being at home but watching all these things on various uh, <laughs> platforms and social media just coming at you, people you've been talking to before, having a lot of phone conversations. Um, but um, there's various kinds of uh, misinformation and disinformation. And uh, I should probably leave you to, to decide which is which. Uh, so the first thing is we've seen um, the kind of uh, things that we've seen everywhere in the world and he, what you mentioned, you know, that this uh, virus has been, um, uh, has been manufactured in some kind of lab in China, the, 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 kind, of, uh, 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 the kind of narrative that hydroxychloroquine is, uh, is a game changer drug. I've actually seen the word game changer being used a lot, even in the mainstream media. Mm. Uh, but yes, unfortunately, um, some of the information, misinformation has come out from one of our union ministries itself, which is the Ministry for Ayush, which was, uh, which is uh, supposed to promote uh, uh, alternative uh, medicine. So this is Ayurveda, yoga, homeopathy. Um, and in the, uh, in very early on when uh, people were getting affected by COVID, or we were seeing, you know, a few, a few cases here, uh, they put out some kind of advisory on um, uh, on how some of these alternative ther therapies can uh, can be used to manage COVID symptoms. Now, of course, there was a huge pushback from this from the scientific community, from public health activists, uh, and they kind of pedaled back and said that uh, no, the, this uh, you know we mean that it will just boost immunity at this time of the pandemic, which again is not proven by any kind of global stand. Act act a global acceptable standard. Um, so one of those things was uh, that cow urine uh, boosts immunity or, or helps you not get COVID in some way. Now we've heard this thing about that, that cow urine is some kind of panacea for all sorts of things in the last few years. Uh, but on the ground, we actually saw people having a party where they all shared, uh, you know, where they all drank cow urine. And by the way, completely, uh, completely ignoring all norms of social distancing. People were all, you know, sitting very close together and having this cow urine party. 
and uh, one 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 of the people who attended that actually felt very sick. Mm. Um, so uh, yes, I mean, so this kind of information uh, is is going around, and it's very rampant. Uh, the other uh, rumor that's been going around, particularly in India, I think, is uh, this thing about temperature and the virus. That you know, when it gets hot enough in the Indian summer, mm. uh, we are not, you know, if Indians are good, aren't going to be affected. Uh, and as uh, a virologist just pointed out to me just an hour ago in the other webinar that I was on, that this came, this probably came from a group of climate scientists uh, tracking the course of the virus in places that have been badly affected, like Wuhan in New York, where the temperature is mm. very different. But of course, correlation is not uh, causation. Yes. Uh, it's been picked up as, oh no, we're not going to get it so badly here in India. Mm. That's a really important point. Correlation is not causation, which is something we, we are familiar with if we've been, you know, science reporters or health reporters, um, perhaps, you know, with developing expertise over a period of time. But when you're in the midst of uh, reporting an incredibly fast moving pandemic, which has its associated infodemic and certainly um, the disinfodemic as well, based on our research, you, you end up in a situation where, you, you know, you haven't even got time <laughs> to um you know to, to perhaps do in-depth interviews with sources that you rely on and trust let alone um you know find multiple news sources perhaps i mean that's the experience i'm sure of um some journalists you know particularly in under-resourced news organizations in parts of the world where um you know this is hit hard so it, can i just ask you to reflect on that a bit um Nayantara, if if you're presented with these sorts of myths legends, memes, you know, whatever um, format or theme this uh, erroneous health information connected to COVID-19 takes, what's the first step that, that uh, you would take, you know, if you, if you were um, in, a, in a news reporting role trying to uh, navigate this? Right. Um, again, you know, this is a, a conversation I've been having with multiple people covering, um, uh, covering the pandemic. And I think the first thing is to go to the experts that you trust and actually talk to multiple sources, multiple primary sources to try and uh, figure out to, to come as close to the truth as possible. Um, the other thing that is very important, of course, is uh, to know that in many of these situations, uh, there are no black and white answers. A lot of these myths uh, and rumors are based on a grain of truth and then built mm -hmm. into something else. Very often, uh, they split into false binaries. For example, here in India, a lot of people, a lot of journalists, a lot of public health activists have been asking for more testing from the beginning uh, of the pandemic. And there was very little te testing right in the beginning. And then this somehow evolved into a conversation about uh, you know, uh, why are people asking for more testing? Because we can't test everyone uh, in the country. And that mm. is a completely false binary, right? Uh, asking for more testing is not asking to test everyone. Everybody, uh, yeah. We, yeah. Yeah, we have to have the data to make uh, decisions to, for people to know how long this lockdown has to last. Uh, so th I think the first thing is probably to point out, to flag those holes in the information and say that we don't know. I think that is something that's critical in a situation like this. Yeah, so acknowledging where there are gaps in knowledge and, and doing the sort of critical reportage that you would expect anybody to be doing in any context, um, which I have certainly witnessed uh, in the UK and uh, in, in observing uh, the Australian environment, which is my you know, home country, um, a reluctance to be robustly critical uh, of even political leaders uh, spreading disinformation or misinformation because of this sense that we're, you know, we're in this, we're fighting a pandemic, we have to support public health efforts. So mm -hmm. I wouldn't mind uh, coming back to that in a moment. But just on that point, and Andy, um, you alluded to this, you've both alluded to it, this intersection of uh, political, uh, politically motivated or political uh, mis or disinformation and COVID-19 and the ways in which we're seeing politicians, in fact, suggest strongly that a particular medication uh, is a cure or an effective treatment or will be or is about to be declared as such. Um, that's a particularly difficult kind of narrative to counter, isn't it? When you're, when you're looking for leadership as a citizen 
in the midst of a, of a pandemic. Andy, can I just get you to unpack that a bit more? I mean, you, you gave us several examples of where you're seeing that happening around the world. Let's start with the way um, your team is, is reporting on this. What, what approach are you taking? Well, we, we basically take an approach similar to uh, what we were just discussing in that you have to have a critical eye and you have to admit what we don't know. And whether it's people pointing to hydroxychloroquine or interferon or cow urine or whatever, I mean, some of them are a little easier to dismiss than others. But the science, for the most part, has been limited in terms of, of testing in this particular context. We finally started seeing in the last few days uh, more, uh, more evidence about the deleterious effects of hydroxychloroquine and how it could actually be making the situation much worse for a number of patients. And the, the thing that including we're, death, right? I mean, inc death including death. death. Yes, exactly. <laughs> in the US. Yes. So perhaps I'm putting it a little too mildly. And what worries me is when politicians point to any particular solution uh, and use it as a way to rally their bases to give them uh, false hope uh, and also as a way of deflecting blame from themselves for not having their act together in terms of other logistics related to pandemic prevention. It's very, very easy to come up with excuses blaming others um, for the situation, which is why you see phrases like foreign virus and China virus used yeah. uh, uh, with lots of stigma uh, here in the US, but very politically intentionally. Uh, but also regarding the, the, the chloroquines, uh, I think by giving that false sense of hope, it allows people to rally around it and, f and it reinforces other behaviors such as let's organize these rallies to uh, to uh, start the economies again and go out in public and stop social distancing because mm. uh, hydroxychloroquine is going to eventually save the day. And so one uh, misleading uh, bit of advice leads to a cascade of others that actually makes the situation much worse because uh, because not everyone is going to uh, be a part of a clinical trial involving these drugs, but a lot more other people might be directly or indirectly affected by others who decided to go out because they felt like a cure was around the corner and they'd be yeah. able to, they'd be able to uh, uh, take a drug and, and, and suddenly get better, better because uh, a political leader told them that was going to be the case. Yeah, so you've got this combination of disinformation and trust in the, in the political leadership that is, in fact, spreading the disinformation or the misinformation. It's with really physical consequences. Um, right, absolutely. Yeah. And uh, because of the war on science and the war on expertise we've seen in the U.S. and elsewhere in recent years, uh, for, for the early stages of the pandemic, uh, it wasn't too surprising to see a number of American politicians being dismissive about early projections and whether or not this was flu-like or even connected to the flu. Mm -hmm. uh, they, even though uh, scientists were already doing full genomic sequencing of the virus uh, in, diff in different countries, there were, you still keep hearing, well, we just don't know. And the, and the thing about that is, that's also the kind of thing you'd want a journalist to say or a scientist to say when, um, when the jury actually is out. And so even the language that we would encourage journalists to use saying, well, we're not sure yet, the jury is still out, we're waiting for more scientific uh, studies, that too can be weaponized to dismiss science mm -hmm. when it's actually straightforward and well-documented. Yeah. And so in some ways, it's a lose-lose situation of no matter how we find ways of phrasing it in a way that is helpful from a journalistic or public health perspective, someone's going to find a clever way of twisting it and using that exact same language. Mm. Well, we've talked about the intersection of, um, of political rhetoric and, and disinformation here and the, the conflict between trust and uh, uh, risk. But um, we've got a question uh, from one of our uh, viewers, Janeth Sekar. Um, who asks uh, about another intersection, and that's the intersection between um, uh, religious bigotry 
and COVID-19 uh, disinformation. So um, I think we'll put this to you first, uh, Nayantara, because we've certainly seen escalation in uh, communal violence in, in India, where Muslims, for example, have been uh, targeted uh, as perhaps being perceived to be, you know, greater vectors of the virus, um, which, which seems from a distance to be deepening the, the polarizations there. Can you uh, reflect on that for us? What have you observed? Uh, Julie, I would say that the escalation in religious violence has been happening for a few years now. Uh, the COVID-19 pandemic has, uh, kind, has continued that. Uh, very surprisingly, COVID has become another excuse uh, for communalization. And I say it surprisingly because when we saw the first few incidents, uh, a lot of us in India were like, how did we manage to make this also? about uh, Hindus versus Muslims, uh, etc. cetera. Um, uh, and it, it really began with one event, a religious uh, gathering in New Delhi, uh, which was later found, uh, you know, there were uh, COVID cases found from there. Uh, and, uh, you know, the thing we must remember is that this gathering happened before there was any kind of lockdown. Uh, it happened on days, uh, you know, on, on one of the days uh, of, of that gathering, uh, public health officials had actually come out and said that uh, co uh, coronavirus is not a health emergency for India. Uh, mm. It was a time when we were still getting used to social distancing. People, uh, you know, states and cities were slowly, they were closing down parks and schools and, um, and uh, colleges, but the full impact of what was going to happen had not hit us yet. And there were many such gatherings happening around. Uh, but once this happened, and once there were many, like thousands of cases that came out of that particular event, uh, the, the narrative has just been so uh, communally, communally charged uh, that people, uh, uh, you know, they start, started using, it, the, you know, the event was Tabiki Jamaat, and everyone's, uh, they started calling this the Jamaati virus, so Jamaati Jihad. Uh, and you'll see this on uh, news channels, you'll see it all across social media. Mm. Um, and that has, from there, that triggered off, I think, a spate of these fake news videos that would go around on WhatsApp and other social media, um, uh, saying that um, uh, Muslims were deliberately spitting in places around people to spread the virus, um, that, uh, you know, old videos were repurposed, uh, you know, to, to kind of spread this narrative. And this has had real, real world impacts in, in, in parts of India and Uttar Pradesh. Uh, Muslim vendors have been stopped from, from uh, you know, Muslim vegetable vendors have been told to shut shop and go away. People actually even, there was one news report that said people actually even returned the vegetables that they bought from these particular vendors. Mm. Uh, so these people are losing their livelihoods. Yes, yeah. there's also been actual violence against uh, people. Um, there, uh, there, there was a hospital uh, in some city, I, I, don't, I don't remember where, uh, that actually had a sign outside saying that we will not treat Muslim patients, uh, well. which, you know, completely goes against any, uh, you know, any principles that a medical, any medical professional should have. Um, so yes, this is, a, this is taken a very unfortunate, very communal turn in India. And as we speak, it's, it's just, it's going on. You, you see new events, for example, uh, the announcement of the extension of the lockdown uh, that yes. happened just a few days ago. Uh, on that day, there was uh, uh, a huge gathering of migrants outside the station, a railway station in Bombay, uh, because they had been waiting for the lockdown to be lifted to go back home because they weren't finding work in Bombay. And, you know, also in the middle of a pandemic, everyone wants to go home. Uh, so, um, what is, what's been established is that people gathered there based on two rumors. One was that train services were going to be started again. And the second was that there was going to be distribution of food. Uh, neither of these things were happening. So there were thousands of these migrant laborers outside, um, outside the station, which were, who were eventually dispersed by the police. The narrative on a lot of news channels uh, that evening and later was that these people had gathered near the mosque. Now, yes, there was a mosque there, but people had actually gathered outside the station. Uh, so that's the kind, that's the way this narrative is being, uh, you know, that's how it's going in India, where a lot, there's a blame game on the, you know, 
putting, putting the onus of the spread of the virus on the Muslims. Which does seem to be, I mean, we've found that, you've, you've mentioned that, Andy, we've seen it in reporting, we've certainly found it in our research, this, this uh, you know, uh, crossover between um, uh, xenophobia, racism and religious bigotry uh, and COVID-19 disinformation. It's one of the really uh, evident um, trends that's emerging. So, um, I can also point out, you know, before the, this whole anti-Muslim rhetoric uh, began here, in the early part of uh, the, uh, the epidemic in India, uh, there was a lot of uh, uh, violent behavior towards people from the Northeast who have, you know, whose physical features are compared with people from China. In fact, this kind of bigotry was seen even before, like in, in metros, people would be called names uh, uh, based on how they look. Uh, but this whole Chinese virus thing uh, mm -hmm. actually led to a spate of, of bizarre in incidents like people would spitting on women from the Northeast and say, uh, go Corona, go, or go back to China and, and really weird things like that. So it's not just the communal angle here. It's, it's, it's also other, other it's the, race, the racism as well. I mean, it's, 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 it's so frightening, really, um, as though the virus is not frightening enough to be in a situation where you see this social breakdown. Um, but we've got a question from uh, uh, several people, but one that I think um, we should take now. It's from Uganda, um, Joshua Kisawuzi. Sorry, Joshua, if I'm getting your name wrong. Um, he points to the fact that in trying to cover these incredibly complex and frankly high risk uh, stories, whether they're being reported remotely with all of the digital risks and threats that go with um, delving into this territory um, of, of investigating disinformation, or physically, um, he points to the risk associated with journalists um, asking challenging questions and seeking to investigate in the context of a, a government um, threatening to arrest, de you know, remove the license for reporting if, if uh, they're operating in a country where licensing is in place um, applied to journalism um, or being, you know, threatened with other uh, judicial or um, law enforcement measures for trying to do their job. So this is, you know, in parallel with uh, the need to deepen our expertise and our, um, you know, commitment to, to robust um, traditional reporting methods along with the more kind of, you know, the Andy specialist area of the sort of digital forensics, we have this other challenge of um, states, uh, law enforcement and others um, applying these sorts of regulations. What's, what's your response to that as another source of risk and threat for journalists trying to cover this stuff. Have you, Andy, had to deal with any of this uh, with your reporters who may be working in countries where this is a threat? Well, for reporters of ours that are in countries or regions that are have potential threats, um, so far COVID-19 has been the least of our worries uh, okay. because these are often states uh, that have oppressive regimes or have neighbors that are oppressive regimes and are exhorting an extraordinary amount of pressure on their home countries, uh, or um, they, they, they don't want us reporting on certain things because it reflects poorly on the political po party mm -hmm. in power. And so, um, so in, in a sense, nothing, not much has changed for us because they were already at risk. Okay, so you already and, had those. Right, and I think, and I, I think in countries where journalists are under threat uh, due to their COVID-19 coverage, in most cases at least, they're countries that already bullied and threatened and arrested journalists for other reasons, which is why I don't have much very good advice, unfortunately, beyond the traditional advice that one would give to reporters working in oppressive environments about maintaining informational security and the like. But that's, if you're a local reporter in a community and you're working for a local community radio and things like that, uh, all the operational security in the world isn't going to help you if you're trying to cover the safety of your community, whether it's due to governmental oppression or due to COVID-19. Mm. And so it's, uh, it's, it's a very depressing situation that, that certain governments are using COVID-19 as yet another excuse to uh, prevent uh, freedom of the press. And it, that's, I mean, there have been incidents and, uh, and cases in India as well. I don't know, Nantara, if you're um, able to, to reflect on this or uh, to identify them, but I've certainly heard it from other Indian editors and, and journalists that there's been you know, pressure applied, for example, to 
uh, publish uh, in line with government perspectives, uh, for, for example. So do you have any insight into um, how that affects attempts uh, to investigate? One of the examples this journalist um, gave was when trying to investigate um, officials, you know, perhaps engaged in fraud or theft using the cover of COVID-19 um, and how to go about investigating that sort of thing. Mm. Well, that's one I haven't heard, uh, Julie, but that's yes. certainly something people should look into. I think a, a large problem here is that, um, yes, there is pressure on, um, on um, journalists to do positive stories. Uh, you know, it's, it's been reported that the Prime Minister himself had a video conference with several editors and asked them to portray the government's work in a positive light. Um, but there's also been a, a, a lot, I mean, the, the health ministry in its briefings itself has been very opaque. Uh, it, it's restricted journalists' access uh, uh, to them progressively. And in a situation where we're in lockdown and you're only webcasting uh, your, your briefing and you're uh, cherry picking a couple of questions out of several quest questions that are submitted to you. Uh, this is what I'm hearing from other journalists. That's what they have to deal with. Mm -hmm. uh, so on the one hand, um, the, you know, the government is saying that, you know, don't misreport. Uh, but on the other hand, they aren't answering journalist questions uh, uh, accurately or on time uh, very often. Uh, so yes, it's a huge problem that my colleagues are facing. Mm. So one of the other questions um, is one that's common to those of us who've worked in the space of uh, combating disinformation or misinformation through um, journalistic endeavors. And that is whether to ignore and when to ignore <laughs> evidence of misinformation and disinformation. Now, I know um, our colleagues at First Draft and other organisations um, have written uh, and uh, researched on, on this theme um, about when it's appropriate to signal content and to surface it for a broader audience and when it's not. Andy, what's your experience and uh, advice on this? What, what, what do you apply um, in your uh, environment? Well, when we see a narrative emerging, the first thing we ask ourselves uh, is, does it have any traction yet? Or is it just some random guy screaming into the, uh, the infinite, infinite internet hoping that it takes hold? If it doesn't have traction, we will note it, we'll sometimes continue to track it, but we don't make a stink about it. Because that's what a lot of these bad actors are looking for. They want mm. the attention. And so while there is no, I, I don't believe that there should be a formula to, to say when something has reached attraction, I think you just need to use editorial judgment as to whether it's happened or not. But there are times when essentially an idea has gotten out into the wild and is on, is on the verge of taking on a life of its own or it's clearly beginning to impact certain populations. That's when I think it's important to start covering it. But what I worry about is... Um, even though I'm an enormous supporter of fact-checking organizations and fact-checkers in general, uh, I, I do worry about exhaustion, fact-checking exhaustion by the public, mm. as well as people who spread misinformation or believe in mis or disinformation. They don't care what fact-checkers are saying anything in, in, anyways, because it reinforces their beliefs, which is why I think George Lakoff had it right a couple of years back when he started talking about uh, presenting uh, mis and dis disinformation as part of a truth sandwich. Uh, the idea being is if if you are going to fact checking fact check something rather than just saying so and so is claiming that something has happened and here's why they're wrong, what you do is you start your your coverage by talking about what the truth is, mm -hmm. and then in the middle of it you you then mention the fact that some people are getting it absolutely wrong and are being misleading about it and then go back to the truth again. And mm. so the misleading information gets sandwiched in an informational package that's reinforcing the truth rather than making it seem like we're always playing defense mm. because fact checking in many ways often comes across as def defensive. So how do you take that and, and do it on a, on a stronger, more confident footing so we can call BS in a way that actually has traction. 
I mean, look at the debates at the moment uh, in the US around uh, live press conferences from, from the president. Right. Uh, where there have been many calls for, for those broadcasts to end from very reputable journalists, editors and media academics, for example. I'm not sure what your perspective on that is, but I've noticed recently, I mean, CNN is still broadcasting live, but trying to run uh, tickers across the bottom of the screen with the, you know, the occasional real-time fact check as they're able to under enormous pressure. Uh, now this was doing, um, I noticed live Facebook uh, video streaming in parallel with the president's um, address uh, this week. Yeah, the, I mean, honestly, the only way I think that could work is if they made it funny. Yeah. You know, I think if it, the John Olivers of the world or the yeah. Trevor Noahs, if I think if if they took it upon themselves to live stream events and put their teams of, of, of writers and improvisational comedians to be responding in real time yeah. so people can understand that so many of these events are political stunts and jokes, it then it then uh, puts uh shares of misinformation and disinformation on on a defensive footing i mean i i i personally am getting increasingly uncomfortable with airing of of press conferences uh uh w without being able to keep false information in check and mm. so uh, if you absolutely have to do it find a way of mock it of mocking it or find a way of 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 presenting it in a way that people from the moment they turn on the stream, they they go in with a skeptical eye mm -hmm. and understand that we can't we can't trust what's being said. I mean, once again, we turn to the. I mean, it's an excellent idea, and once again, we turn to the satirists to defend us right. from fake and, news. And you uh, know, and, and when it when it comes to fighting uh, misinformation and disinformation, I think humor is one of the best tools we have. Mm -hmm. um, I think since it, it, given a certain percentage of the population that's going to believe. Um, conspiracy theories and rumors and aren't going to listen to fact checkers if they're more likely to listen to comedians especially ones that are of similar backgrounds then that's what we should be doing more of okay what's your view um on that problem Nayantara I mean uh, I know for example having worked closely with um the Quint in India that you know efforts around collaborative uh, fact checking and particularly um you know high rotation debunk stories um, is something that they've practiced. And I know that's also an approach that um, Rappler in the Philippines, for example, which has been, you know, a, a massive target of, of disinformation campaigns orchestrated and otherwise, they do something similar. But to the point about whether we get to a, to a stage of fact check fatigue, particularly in the context of an infodemic, um, what, what, what do you um, observe is, is the best way to deal with this? I mean, are there parameters that you would suggest? Right. Um, so in India, I have to give a shout out to Alt News, which is a fantastic fact checking organization. Um, and seeing how people have responded to, fact, or to Alt News uh, fact checks and Alt News stories during this time, uh, I don't believe that there is uh, fact-checking fatigue here yet. Uh, uh, I know that you know there is this joke that I was probably this is probably true of anywhere in the world, but family WhatsApp groups are really the the place where all misinformation happens. Uh, and I've seen several people uh, sharing alt news fact checks every time someone shares uh, a, a, a doctored video or a clip. Uh, a, a video or, or some bizarre news article on their WhatsApp groups. Um, so I haven't seen that happening here yet. Maybe it will. Uh, but, you know, I, I think Andy, Andy had a great point that people who don't want to believe, mm. uh, aren't, the fact checking is not going to make a difference uh, to them. I mean, any narrative can be twisted into, uh, in, in, into things that they want to believe. There's also some evidence from research too that it, it in fact uh, works as a reinforcement because fact checkers are perceived to be representatives of the enemy, you know, the political yeah. camp. Uh, uh, but Nayantara just made an extremely important point regarding mm. the uh, community WhatsApp groups mm. with people within the groups sharing fact checks. Uh, to me, that reinforces the idea that combating uh, misinformation and disinformation, especially during a pandemic, it's a civic duty that requires everyone's involvement. If, mm -hmm. if it's only professionals 
working to correct the public record or clarify what the science is, there will always there will continue to be misinformation and disinformation spreading. But if you're able to get people to realize that uh, they need to be looking out for the safety of their families, their friends, their communities, in the same way that people in many parts of the world have embraced social distancing as a civic duty, uh, distancing ourselves from misinformation and disinformation is is almost as important, if not more important in some contexts. And so the question is, how do you communicate the message to a broader public that now we've gotten all of you to embrace flattening the curve? How, if, when it comes to the pandemic, how do you flatten the infodemic curve? Mm. Because we're I not going to be able to do it all ourselves. Yeah, I think that's really both very important points. I mean, one of the things that I often reflect on is um, a conceptualization from a, a friend who's a South African academic called Julie Reed, and she um, has has written about media freedom being a collective right and also a collective responsibility. And if we want to be able to um, indeed claim our rights to um, say what we want to whom we want when we want as citizens in addition to being journalists then surely we have this parallel responsibility that andy's underlined um, to defend truth to ensure that facts are surfaced to debunk actively where possible and i guess this is a really um interesting twist on that um description andy that you gave and i know this is a common view in the west that we need to pull back for example from perhaps the rate of fact checks we're publicizing because of this perceived fatigue uh, but also because it can reinforce um, some of the, the, the myths themselves. But perhaps what we're saying is there's two tracks, that when it comes to dealing with the closed environments of, um, of messaging apps, for example, that's where every time we encounter disinformation within our network of what 200 or 300 maximum people we're connected to, that we each as citizens have a responsibility to be the social journalists that a decade ago we were talking about everybody having the capacity to be. Yeah, I know. I think that's exactly it. And again, I, I just want to make clear, I'm not discouraging fact checking or mm -hmm. suggesting that we should be doing less. I think uh, we need to continue being aggressive about it, but think about how we're framing it and how to get it into the hands of the people who are most likely to be affected uh, and to be uh, essentially um, uh, likely spreaders of, of disinformation as well. And, and, I, and I think the civic duty angle through, through community engagement is a big part of it. Uh, which which raises some interesting questions on ways news outlets should be uh, partnering with community-based organizations that serve as intermediaries with a whole range of different community types. Yeah, no, really, really important points. And um, we have a question from Marion Dautry, who um, is interested to know what your views are on measures taken by social media companies, for example, um, uh, the, the, the tech intermediaries to, to counter disinformation. Um, she highlights the early intervention of Pinterest, where if you looked up uh, coronavirus, you've got a message from who, and we've seen um, on top of that, I can say from the research that we just published today, they've made a variety between them, the, the, the uh, internet communications companies formerly known as platforms, that we, um, we uh, have seen both investment in traditional journalism, we've seen um, suddenly an ability to uh, try to downgrade the prominence of disinformation uh, alongside um, elevating credible sources connected to coronavirus search. There's a whole lot of actions that for many years we've been told were not possible um, or not possible to do in a way that was sustainable, uh, say, connected to political disinformation. But what's your view, um, and we'll come, come to you first, uh, Nayantara, because I think it's your turn. Um, what's your view on uh, the responses that you've observed from the platforms to this crisis? Uh, to, from social media? Platforms? Yeah, in terms of trying to fight the, the mis and disinformation uh, within their own platforms and take responsibility. Let's look at that first. Right. I mean, this is not something that I've been uh, looking at very closely, Julie. I think Twitter did do something. Um, I mean, they are. I I do see a few more instances, for instance, of accounts spreading with information either being blocked. Uh, that I, I don't think that I expected to see them before the pandemic. They might be taking a little more seriously now, but I, you know, I can't comment uh, further on that. No, that's okay. It's a it's a question from from somebody um, observing. Andy, what about you? 
in your uh, work. I don't know if you have any active partnerships. Yeah, uh, um, yeah, we we have pretty good relations, uh, generally very good relations with most of the platforms. Uh, and full disclosure, uh, we, we receive funding from Facebook. Uh, but we see ourselves as a collaborative watchdog in which uh, we find ways of working together while trying to identify what's working and what's not not working on, on, on the various platforms. So for example, with Facebook, uh, as they identify uh, examples of, of inauthentic network uh, behavior uh, on, on, uh, on Facebook, they will often give us a heads up so we can begin doing forensic analysis. Well, we don't have access to any of their backend tools, but simply by observing what pages are publishing, who they're following, how they're interacting with each other we're often able to paint a picture of, of, of how they're coordinated if they are. Um, but all, I think all the platforms are really, they're, they're doing, they're, they're, I, there are lots of people working at these platforms doing their, their level best to combat this because they, they know how much uh, it's affecting everyone, including their own families. Um, but it's a challenge when you have any network that has hundreds of millions, if not billions of users. And if uh, when platforms have methods of moderation that require human beings, mm. which are generally necessary to make judgment calls, and those people start getting sick, then that yeah. becomes a challenge too. Yeah. And so I think, uh, you know, it, it's tough. Uh, I think some, some people will sing their praises. Some people will always find faults. Uh, I think it's a complicated situation, but seeing what's going on behind the scenes, I can see just the sheer amount of work a number of these platforms are, are taking in order to combat uh, COVID-19 uh, misinformation and disinformation uh, actively and not passively. Do you think there's anything they could do differently or better? I mean, they can always, of course, for anybody, there are possibilities and I know we're in a very fast I mean, yeah, there probably is but it's hard it's hard for me to make concrete uh, recommendations since I'm not an engineer I, I think there are probably some things that could be done on the engineering side of each platform depending on how they're structured that might be able to assist them so for example WhatsApp made the decision uh, it, I don't know if they made it globally or just in certain parts of the world where the number of people you can message at once uh, uh, has been limited to what it was before. And they've done similar things to the, in the past as a way to um, essentially, I mean, it's, it's, the, it's the WhatsApp equivalent of social distancing because the fewer people that are able to pass something on at any given communication, uh, it's flattening the curve uh, in, in, their own, uh, in their own way. But so the, really the only examples that come to mind the only example that comes to mind of, of a platform really not doing anything is Telegram, uh, because uh, Telegram uh, is uh, is it's based out of Russia. It's 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 very well known as a place for national nationalist groups, uh, racist groups, um, and uh, political actors to, uh, and, and militants of all types. Uh, uh, you know, we've seen terrorists using Telegram quite actively over the years. Uh, and it's it's so hard to get a sense of who's behind the posts and who's behind the communities there. Um, in in many ways, Telegram worries a lot worries me a lot more than WhatsApp does because at least the people who who work at WhatsApp recognize what the issues are and are trying to figure out, given how their platform is structured, what they can do to help alleviate uh, disinformation. Yeah, that's a really interesting point. I mean, the Telegram is a platform that certainly many journalists turn to before they turn to Signal uh, as, a, as a sort of secure, potentially, you know, secure right. encrypted app. And, and, and we don't discuss it much anymore, but here we are. Right. And, and you know, having end-to-end having -end encryption is extremely important for journalists and for sources and human rights activists and all mm -hmm. that. Um, but WhatsApp has end-to-end -end encryption, and yet they are, are working actively to think about what they can do within their systems to uh, to decrease the overall load of of disinformation spreading. Whereas, I don't get the sense that that um, Telegram is doing much of anything. Hmm. Um, now, Tara, can you reflect perhaps on some of the lessons you've learned over over your career of um, reporting on? 
health and uh, science and the various you know acts of mis and disinformation you've um, you've encountered and just just think about how those lessons could be applied to reporting this crisis um, and if you can also address because we're coming to the end of time this question and that is what do you think journalists need most uh, on the front line in India in the way of assistance uh, to navigate this infodemic mm. well um you know, I think essentially misinformation and disinformation plays off on fear. Um, if I could just quickly give you an example from before uh, uh, the COVID-19 pandemic, a few years ago um, in, in, in Haryana, North India, uh, there were a few villages that stopped sending their children to school because there were rumors going around that the strangers in the area were injecting children to make them sterile. Now this also took on a communal angle uh, because the rumor was that um, people from Hindu groups were trying to sterilize uh, uh, Muslim children. Now this happened in the middle of a uh, measles rubella campaign and so all the ire was turned towards the healthcare workers then. Now all this fear uh, is, is already there, this misinformation is already there. It just gets exaggerated in a pandemic like this. So we have seen violence against healthcare workers over here, which is awful uh, at a time like this. I mean, at any time, but especially a time like this. Uh, we, uh, you know, we even saw uh, um, a doctor who died uh, of COVID being, did, you know, he wasn't allowed to have, a, his family was not allowed to bury him because there was all this uh, misinformation about, um, uh, about if the body was buried there, then the, the community would be at risk. Uh, so essentially, you know, it's it, it, it's really important not just to debunk um, uh, debunk misinformation, but also give complete information. Because I've noticed that incomplete information triggers the same sorts of fears. Mm, um, which is a context that, point that it, it is truth sandwich. <laughs> yes, absolutely. Yeah. Uh, but for instance, yeah. Uh, so I think that's one of the things that we have to keep in mind. And in terms of Journalists being protected on the front, front line, well, again, journalists themselves need information. A lot of the people who are doing the work on the ground are not people who have covered health and science before. Uh, so they themselves need information in a situation like this. We've seen several journalists uh, having tested positive now uh, in India because perhaps they didn't have the information themselves. Mm. Which it doesn't get more real than that, does it? No. Access to information being so essential um, as we try and confront this. And for everybody's um, amusement and edification, Andy has just been fact-checked in real time uh, during our discussion, and he's already debunked the fact-check. So uh, somebody in our, in our audience pointed out that, um, I'm trying to find you, Yelena uh, Osipova Stocker, she, she says that. It's, it's actually, it's much more complicated than that because Russia has restricted Telegram when Telegram users have used it to target Putin. But but there are enormous pro-Russian channels and active users who use Telegram to support Russia's interests, particularly uh, in their occupation of, of uh, Eastern Ukraine and as well as of parts of Georgia. So, yeah. so that's, that's great. So the question from uh, Yelena was around uh, whether in fact it was based, Telegram was based uh, out of the, uh, out of Russia and whether or not it was banned there. And, um, if you if you are playing along at home after the live chat has disappeared, um, they are now yeah. both in agreement that there is yeah. context always it's, important. Yeah, it's, <laughs> it's, it's complex. It's very very complicated. Yeah. <laughs> Can we finish then, Andy, um, with you? We haven't talked much about some of the methods that you're using um, sure. and and how you're using them to try to report on the the disinformation and misinformation swirling around. This crisis. Can you just walk us through some of the things you're doing and what you're learning in the process? Sure. Well, we're big fans of using uh, publicly available data sets. Uh, so whenever we're able to uh, dig deep into Twitter, uh, Instagram, uh, Facebook, uh, and there are other search tools that are focused on searching on those platforms, uh, we use them. We subscribe to different tools such as um, uh, BuzzSumo and Brandwatch and Meltwater Explore, which are all social media monitoring platforms. Uh, generally, uh, the, that 
that part of the, that industry was created for brands to help them monitor how their businesses were doing, but you can also use it to monitor any sort of rhetorical threads or narratives taking place online. So we apply it to watching influence operations. Uh, but there are free tools out there that allow you to do it as well. For One of my favorites is called Tweet Beaver, of all things. So like tweet <laughs> and the word beaver, like, like the mammal, because .com. Twi twit face was taken. So. Right, exactly. But Tweet Beaver, <laughs> What it allows you to do is it allows you to conduct searches on Twitter and, and, and investigate different user profiles and have the search results downloaded as a CSV file. So for example, last summer, I took a look at a bunch of accounts in French and English that appeared to be a supporting a, a warlord in Libya and for reasons that didn't make any sense for these accounts. And so I used TweetBeaver to download about a hundred of their timelines and put them into a giant CSV file and sort them based on what they were saying. And not only did we discover verbatim patterns of language used to support uh, this warlord against the UN aligned government in Libya, we discovered that there was all sorts of other rhetoric that was, a, be, that was being expressed in these, uh, this, these accounts supporting the political interests of the UAE. Didn't mean that the UAE was running this network. We didn't have, we couldn't find evidence that that was the case, but whoever was running it clearly had interests aligned with the UAE. And I wouldn't have known that if it hadn't been for the free tool Tweet Beaver. And so, uh, so like I said, there, there, are, there are tools out there that you can spend money on, uh, but look, try to see what uh, free and open source tools are out there and experiment. You'd be surprised what you can find through simple Google searches, especially if you find a particular narrative that has spelling mistakes in it or linguistic quirks that seem odd. Rather than searching for the keywords, search for the, the weird phrases, search for the mistakes. And just through searching on Google, you'd be surprised how you can jump from one platform to another. Uh, last year, we, uh, we traced an operation that we referred to as secondary infection, which was an attempt to undermine the EU uh, parliamentary elections. And it was a, a Russian attempt using dozens and dozens of online platforms. And we were able to trace most of it because of Google searches, because they got sloppy and started using the same phrases again and again. And so you don't need fancy tools to begin doing this type of investigative work. There's two prongs. I mean, you can do a kind of analysis of the text to determine patterns in the language, and you can also look at, you know, the network analysis side yeah. of who's connected to And then, to you know, with. reverse image searches and things yeah. like that can, can help you in all sorts of different ways. And of course, if you have, a, uh, have uh, an online following that's constructive and supportive of, of your work, like I did during the Arab Spring, ask questions, tell them what you don't know, uh, see if you can get help from them, uh, because uh, your social media follows can be an extraordinary resource. Can I just ask one final question on that? Because it does fascinate me that, you know, we have moved on um, considerably in, in the world of social journalism in that past decade, but we really have seen a rise in weaponization of the platforms for disinformation um, purposes, much more widespread than it was back then. Are you still using, I know you said you're much more of an editor now than a reporter, but are you still to an extent relying on those public open networks in the way that you did before, or is it harder to do that now? Um, it's a lot harder. That's a whole other webinar. Um, <laughs> well, we'll take that. On yeah, <laughs> I, I, I guess I, listen, I'll put it this way. I still monitor as much as I used, I used to. I'm just not as active as I used to. Um, yeah. it, I, I, during the Arab spring, given that there were days where I was tweeting a thousand times a day, that was a bit much in, <laughs> in, in retrospect. I, I think there were better habits I've developed since then. Yeah. All right. Well, let's 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 uh, actually suggest that as a <laughs> as a future webinar, and I think people would be really uh, en enthusiastic about having you perhaps do something um, that's you know instructive and in in, in taking us through some of your methods where you can where you can reveal them too. So I'm just going to put that out there. Um, thank you very much, uh, Nayantara, for joining us uh, from Bangalore. I was about to say Mumbai again. <laughs> I'm sorry, from Bangalore, um, who's affiliated with Proto, uh, and Andy Carvin uh, from. Uh, from DFR Lab um, for your work. Um, it's been really great to talk to you and for everybody who participated, really um, great to get your enthusiastic uh, questions and, and comments as well, even a live fact check. So um, stay safe, everybody. Um, keep going with that uh, incredible reporting and collaborative reporting that we're seeing evolve on a daily basis within the ICFJ and IJNet uh, 
Global Health Crisis Reporting Forum, um, which we're really proud to facilitate. Um, I think we've got around 2,600 journalists there now from all around the world, working with each other, uh, supporting each other and connecting with experts. Um, so thank you very much again, and uh, we'll see you next time. Thanks thank again. you. Stay safe, Bye -bye. everyone. Thank you.